Okay, welcome everybody. And I'd like to welcome you to our 215th Coffee and Conversation. And again, I think uh, you've set a new record for the number of people we've had attending and crammed into this room uh, since the beginning of the COVID. So again, I just hope all of you are vaccinated and will stay healthy. Uh, as you can see, this actually, it, we have quite a few things going on today. Earlier on, we had the Boulder chapter, the Arleigh Burke chapter of the Military Officers Association, who were having their meeting in our library. After our presentation today, we're going to be having a celebration of the Marine Corps birthday, which uh, officially was the 10th of November, 1775. Uh, and we have some special guests in the background here, which we'll introduce later, uh, ROTC cadets, I presume, from uh, CU. So. That's the next generation of them. Yes. <laughs> okay, exactly. Uh, and a great group. Although I must admit, I'm biased for the Army. So, uh, but anyway, a uh, couple things I just want to highlight and remind you. Uh, December 4th, is going to be our annual meeting for our museum. And that will be held here. Uh, it'll include a kind of a breakfast. And that's where we'll tell everyone who's the next, well, we'll vote on our next set of board of directors, uh, approve the budget for next year, uh, talk a little bit about what we've been doing and what we'd like to do next year. So that will be at 9 o'clock, I think. Uh, so put that on your calendar. We'll put on the sign too, but we'd like to encourage any and all of you to join us uh, and give us some feedback on things as well. Is that December 4th? Uh, de uh, yes, December 4th. Uh, our last coffee and conversation for the year will be December 11th. Normally we try and tie it in with Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, but we will be, the topic will be the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, and we'll have kind of a combination of things. We'll have the basic background in history. Uh, we encourage any of you uh, who might even have been very young then, but might have been around when you heard the announcement of the attack to join us and just tell us your story. What was it like to hear that? and how did it impact your family, your parents' view. Uh, then we'll give you, a, with a, actually a marvelous a model of uh, Ford Island in the area around Battleship Row, we'll cover which battleships were where and how did the attack unroll. Then one of our uh, good members, Jerry Galvinen, who's a marvelous modelier, uh, has built a three-foot model of the USS Arizona. So we'll have that in here, and we'll give a good history of the U.S. Arizona, uh, its armament, what it did before the war, and uh, then uh, we'll kind of finish off uh, with that. So we hope we'll join, you as, join us for that as well. And then the last thing, uh, we have, unfortunately you can't see it, two boxes, one here and upstairs. In fact, John, why don't you come talk sure. about that? So my name is John Petticolos. I'm a retired naval aviator. Um, I'm the vice president of the board here at the museum. Also, I'm the commander of the American Legion Post 58, which uh, meets here at the museum. And we have an office here on the other side of this uh, wall. And part of our uh, activities, especially during the holidays, is to collect items for veterans who are at the VA hospital uh, during Christmas and uh, so what we've done is, if you'll look back underneath the uh, uh, or the picture back there, yep, behind the uh, midshipman, there is a uh, box. There's also one box up in the uh, entryway of the museum. We're collecting items uh, that are stocking stuffers. For instance, little treats, Kleenex, nail clippers, um, anything, socks, uh, clean, you know, new pair of socks things that we can donate to the VA hospital uh, veterans that are there. Also, we donate those to the uh, homeless veterans 
uh, there is a facility in Denver for that. So I want to just bring that up to you if, where that is open on Thursdays and on Saturdays to uh, deposit those things. And then on December 6th, we're going to meet here at noon and uh, fill those stockings. We have approximately 150 that are, uh, sewn Christmas she was, she stockings was, doing a to fill. Job. And uh, then we'll take those down for Christmas uh, for the VA uh, veterans in VA. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, I also had a request uh, by someone to introduce a special visitor as well. Uh, where are, oh, there we go. My name is Gertrude Choice. I moved into Highland Trail in March this year, and I served with the BBSA. And, uh, and at Highland Trail, we have 21 veterans, and I brought one of them with me today, Dr. Lawrence J. Ball. And uh, he's a veteran himself. Thank you. Uh, and we have one more. Yeah, I'd like to introduce Luther Bergman, a retired Army Colonel, uh, World War II field artillery veteran, uh, Korean War chaplain veteran, received the Bronze Star in Korea uh, as a chaplain. So, uh, Luther Bergman. Nelly, in the back, if we have others coming in who would like to join us, we will. We are live streaming it in the library, so you can be more comfortable there. We do have two seats, three seats here, three seats. Okay, and looks like one more here as well, and here. Okay, so we do still have some additional room. All right, well, Janet, Janet is here, so we can officially get going. But again, I'd like very feel very honored to have Wayne join us today uh, to give us his story of service you know exactly at the end of World War II and what could have been you know a tragic invasion of the island which fortunately turned into more of an occupation uh, which when you look at how Japan has come forward from that has been the best thing that could ever have happened to them uh, so what we'll, we'll be doing this kind of a little bit as an interview process. So Wayne, what we'd like you to do is just go ahead and start telling your story, where you were born, grew up, and we might prod you occasionally with a question or two. So I can talk a little bit about what I Yes, grew up. and I do have some slides which I'll kind of manage okay. that can just help you along. Okay. So anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Wayne Luth. Wayne, you can sit. You don't have to stand for us. Okay. I got one to bump my leg. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I was born and raised in South Dakota, right on the border. And we had a farm there where Dad was farming 160 acres, and uh, that that kept us busy. Now I had a brother that was a year and a half older than I was, and of course he he started school there, and he took me to school one day to visit and to get a kind of a feel for that. And that was my first first shot at that, and. Uh, and we, we stayed through one more year in, in, uh, in that farm there. And uh, during that time was, was the... Uh, was that the Great Dust Bowl period, kind of? Yeah, that was, well, that was a little later. That was, that was a few years later, the Dust Bowl. And, uh, but this one here was during the, when the rabbit lays the eggs for under, under the porch. 
Yeah. We, we just came home from church and, the, and the, this rabbit ran out from our, under our porch. Well, my brother and I, he was a little older than I, we took out after this rabbit, chased him into Iowa and then through North Dakota and back, <laughs> back into South Dakota because we were living right on the corner post. Never did catch him, of course. And then in the meantime, I think my mother had something to do with that. There was a whole bunch of eggs under the porch when we came back. But, uh, well, that was kind of exciting. But we stayed. We what stayed. type of duties did you have on the farm growing up? Well, at that time, I, were, I didn't have any other than gathering the eggs, maybe. And because uh, I was only four years old. And uh, my brother started school there. He was a year, year and a half older than I was. And uh, so he got started in first grade, and he took me to school as a, to kind of get a feel for it. And uh, we, we spent that time, and we were just renting. We didn't own the place, we were just renting. But uh, Dad and Henry Ford had come out with a new Model T. Dad went down and bought one. And we parked the sleds, we parked the buggy. Man, that was a big occasion to have that Model T. So uh, my, my mother then, she was going to take my cousin, who was visiting us, and my brother and I to Sunday school. Well, when, when she drives, she would just held on to the wheel like that, and wherever the car went, it just slowly went over, tipped over. <laughs> With us in it. But uh, all the damage was done was just one window got broken. That wasn't too bad. So, that was the last time she tried to drive. But the, the following, we only stayed there a year after that, that we, we were just renting. So then we made a move across the state to the other side of Sioux Falls to a town, to a farm that was uh, the other side of Sioux Falls and, and near Humboldt, South Dakota. And we settled in there. And uh, the first winter that we were in there, it must have snowed about three feet. And everything was covered up. We had a drift around our house seven feet high. We couldn't even get out to milk the cows. We couldn't let the animals out of the barn because the snow was too deep. So we had, a, we had a big problem working through that. That was one of our little handicaps. And the train couldn't get in the hovel. And the people were, they were on relief at that time, getting their food delivered by the train. Well, the train was stuck outside of Humboldt. So they got all the farmers together to bring their, their grain shovels and shovel that down far enough to where the, the train could hit the drift and blow it out of there. Well, as kids, we all thought that was a lot of fun because we took our sleds over there. <laughs> Slid down the hill and you could sit on top of the telephone poles. And uh, that was a pretty big deal. Well, they finally got that shoveled out and got the train in and unloaded. And that tragedy was over. <clears throat> Everybody got their boxes of food. I don't know what the, what the, it was a relief deal or just what it was. But uh, and we had just stayed on that farm one more year because somebody else owned it. And usually what happened when we went in, we cleaned it all up and then they, the owner would put send their kids in there because the work was all done. So we had to move again. So we now found, on the, found another farm just close to Hartford and we moved there and got settled in and had got in one year on that farm. We did a lot of work on that farm. And I thought this isn't working out very good. <laughs> and uh, then the owner of that farm, his kids wanted to move into it. So we had to move again. And then we got another place that was still 
close to Hartford, and it was a, it was a nice set of buildings and stuff, and and we were still renting yet we we hadn't bought a farm yet, but this was working out, and the, and the, the grade school was like you've seen around here. It's a one room, and a, on an acre of ground, and it had a little had a little barn there, so us kids could ride our ponies at school, and uh, that was that was fun even though all we had to do was just crawl over the fence. <laughs> and uh, we still uh, would still ride our pony. And uh, once I finished, uh, there was, uh, what was it, nine? Ten, ten kids in, in, the, in their various classes. And one teacher taught all ten, all eight grades is the way that worked out. And uh, we had a couple of families that had come from the old country. Uh, they were they were Dutch, and we had we had to kind of work with them. And they they were they were very poor. My mother would make sandwiches for them, so the kids would have something to eat at school. And uh, so we we finally got them to the way it was Americanized, <laughs> and that was a good thing. So, <coughs> anyway, we're going to what finish grades by were the, you there? Were you the, in that school up to high school, or? Yeah, I, I went there to the eighth grade. That, was, that school just went to the eighth grade, and all eight grades were in one room and one teacher. And uh, we had several different teachers while I was going there. I think they were training, training there. Well, then when we got out of there, we, my brother and I, we did some odd jobs for the neighbors, and we made, I think we made $40 picking corn and shocking grain, because that was the two main crops, was, was corn and oats and barley, and small grain. And uh, we made enough money that we bought a Model A Ford, and uh, that's, we got that for $40. That was a pretty good bargain. <laughs> so we drove that, to, drove that to school, which the high school was in town of Hartford. And that was two miles from where, we, where our farm was. And we picked up uh, two more students on the way. No, three more students we picked up and hauled with us and charged them 15 cents a piece. <laughs> Did you did you drive the Ford or your father? Or no, what? no, my brother. Oh, you're okay. Yeah, you know, my Canada. older brother. He drove. No, he did. He wouldn't let me drive. <laughs> so he drove, and uh, we we went through uh, our four four grades of school there, and there was uh, what was there? Yeah. Eight boys and eight girls. Yeah, in our in our <coughs> class, and uh, Professor Professor Goulson, he was our he was our major teacher. We had individual teachers, but he seemed to be always kind of working with us boys, helping us out a little bit. I don't know if he had anticipation of a war starting or not, because he kept urging me to take up typing and and learn how to type and do that. So I did, I took a class in typing. And uh, sure enough, a war broke out. And then we, uh, but we, we all graduated from there, the eight boys and eight girls, all the eight boys went into the service. Well, what do you remember of the attack on Pearl Harbor and how your parents reacted and everyone around you? And how did you hear about it? We we just you know we just said we're gonna go over there and kick their butt, you know. We were all worked up and ready to roll. Nobody was hanging back. In fact, there were there were a lot of them. Well, including my brother, he went off and enlisted before we even knew it. And uh, a lot of the others enlisted too. Yeah, in fact, we have a picture up there of you once yeah, you're in the army, brother, your mother. Right and your brother there. My mother and that's yeah, me. That's what, Kenneth? My, yeah, Kenneth. Kenneth. That was Kenneth. 
And when uh, he was in the Navy and he was a gunnery instructor on the, uh, on the West Coast, or East Coast rather. He was a gunnery instructor. Well, in the meantime, I had taken my training. I got, I got drafted also. I took my training at Camp Hood, Texas. And uh, that was just a regular infantry. But I, I excelled in shooting, and because that's all we did when we was on the farm was shoot, was hunt. And so I didn't have no problem with that. Well, then, when, uh, when I got done with that, then we, I, I, I got drafted and went on to get shipped out to Camp Hood, where we, it was Camp Hood then, Fort Hood now, and uh, took my basic training there. And uh, I actually kind of enjoyed it. It was pretty rough training, but we got through it okay. What type of weapons were you trained on? Well, I, I trained with the uh, M1 rifle, was a, probably the main weapon, and the bayonet, and then uh, the 30 caliber machine gun. We trained with that a lot. So uh, when we got, got done with that, well, then they selected us and, and, and uh, shipped us shipped us out to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, where we got on, got on a ship. And, uh, so I think this is a picture of the ship you were on. It yeah, actually, it, so. before the war, was an Italian kind of luxury liner. Yeah, USS, which was in turn USS in Hermitage. It was a luxury liner that had been gutted out. It was just stacked with boats. And you slept three deep. You just you had to get in sideways. You had your rifle, your helmet, and mask, and you slid in there sideways. And you, you stacked up three deep. And well, you must have had a duffel bag with other equipment and stuff. So yeah. where would that just be? Well, we just had it hanging on the front of the oh. boat. And you took as little as possible. You know, change your clothes and you know, your rifle was the main thing, and your helmet. And uh, so, yeah. what would be a typical day be like during the crossing? Well, if you weren't sick, <laughs> then you try to get up and get a little fresh air, but. We got in a storm three days after we, we took off, which wasn't good. And the ship was nose down with the screws out of the water. And I, I knew this was the end because it wasn't like being in that rowboat on Wall Lake. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but it, it got itself righted again. We all got back. I, I was on KP duty when we hit that storm, and I was going across the kitchen with a, uh, or the eating area with a tray full of cups. Well, I threw them all down. I don't think any of those re survived. And, uh, but eventually it, it settled down, and we sailed on into a cup to go, and we got. I don't know how far we were from the coast of Japan, but all of a sudden we were in a field of mines. Yeah. There was these great big magnetic mines. There was one on each side of the, I don't know why there wasn't somebody on the front of that ship on the bow that spotted that, but there wasn't. I guess they, but those mines were floating on both sides. And, of course, if we have hit one of those, we'd been probably wouldn't, I wouldn't be speaking here. But uh, we had some Marines on board, and they came up and tried to shoot those pins that were sticking out. That, but the, they were hard to hit; they couldn't hit them. But the, but this particular ship had been fitted with a three-inch, three-inch gun up on the foredeck, and so they broke that out, and. 
he was pretty good with that. So we succeeded in detonating all the mines that were around us. And uh, I think there was, a, I think there was actually six mines in that area that we had to blow up before we could move the ship. Well, we got that done. That was kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so on your trip from Seattle or wherever on, on to Japan, you made no stops in Hawaii or anything? It was straight no, through? No, no stops. Oh. No stops on the way out. We had one on the way back. But uh, no, we kept right on going. Then we landed in, in a port in, in Japan and we pulled in there, and they had there was a, a actually a ramp that went down that you could pull up to, and they opened the front of the ship to let the men out. And I was one of the first ones out, and uh, there was one girl standing on the dock. There was one girl, and and uh, I don't know whether she expected to be shot or what was going to happen, but she. Uh, she said, no, boy, you know, no shoot, no shoot or something like that. And uh, so then we just all piled off of there. And uh, and it didn't Japan, well, they didn't, there weren't many, really any quarters in Japan. And I've got to tell you, Japan was, was, a, was probably the dirtiest place I've ever been in my life. There was no sanitation. Everything was just on the streets. I mean, you couldn't eat anything that grew in Japan. You couldn't drink any water that was came out of a well in Japan. The guy rode around in a bicycle, pulling a little cart, and picking up human waste, and, and then fill it up the back end of the cart. Then they hauled it to a central location, and then they used that for fertilizing the next year when they put their crops in which was just rice. Go ahead. Well, let me just highlight quickly on, on the map up here. Uh, that is the area where Wayne was. Uh, Osaka was the main port and city there. I think it's like 2.7 million people today. And Taka, Takarazuka, where you end up spending your time, was just kind of in the suburbs out, oh, out yeah. near there. So in terms of Tokyo's right up about along in here. Uh, actually, Hiroshima uh, is, let's see, it's down along through there. So you were in an area that certainly had been quite devastated. Right. Yeah, we went, we went through there. We, went, we started going door to door. But uh, the emperor, he, he gave orders for everybody to turn in their weapons. And when the emperor in Japan spoke, everybody listened. I mean, they, nobody said he was wrong. And the, the samurai swords and rifles started coming in and just truckloads, basically. We had, we had piles of samurai swords you couldn't even get in this room of every kind. And, uh, I don't know where they all ended up, but everybody picked out a few. Pete, including me, I got a couple. <laughs> and but were you living then in tents? We, no, we never had no tents. We never had no cover. We, we just had our sleeping bag, which was that blanket with a zipper on. Right. And there was ten of us. Ten of us that slept under. So pup tents, essentially. We never had pup tents or nothing, just a sleeping bag. That's all no, we had. No cover and a, at all. And a cot. Okay. And if they, if they issued you, they usually issued you a chocolate bar. And uh, if you didn't eat that right away, and you, some of the guys took it in their sleeping bag with them at night, well, the rats were in the sleeping bag, and they had those chocolate bars ate up before the guy had ever got a chance to eat them. And that's pretty scary to have a rat in your sleeping bag. So, so they soon learned that uh, that wasn't a good idea. If they issued you anything to eat, eat it right now. And uh, 
But we never had no no roof or anything. We just our cots were just up. So I, I was never under a roof for the entire period of time that I was there. Mm -hmm. Except for we, well, I got to take that back. We were, the police, the guy that was the police chief in that area that we were in, he was from Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a pretty good guy. And the, he'd have us, our group, come over and and uh, have a beer and, and play. He had one record he kept playing. I never thought I'd ever forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. <laughs> so that was our entertainment. And the rest of the time we was, we just barely, you know, we went around patrol and we found anything. Uh, the airplanes, there was one airfield that was close to where we were stationed, and we just pulled the planes in the, into a circle and threw some boxes and, and kerosene or gasoline in there and destroyed all them. Rifles and, and that type of equipment we hauled out in the bay and dumped over the side. And anything that, anything that would blow up, we just destroyed it, got rid of it. The only thing that got saved was the samurai swords. And uh, they passed out among the men, and, the, and I think the officers got the best, the best of the bunch. <laughs> well, did you operate kind of in a squad-sized group? I mean, you wouldn't be going out alone, I would yeah, think. Yeah, I went out alone a lot. Really? And uh, the one night I went out, one night I went out alone. And I was out patrolling along pretty close to the coast. And of course, those buildings, most of them were, had been bombed and damaged. But, and I didn't, was notified that the Navy had docked and the sailors had gotten off. And I heard all this noise coming out of this out of this one building. So I went in there to check that out. I didn't know what was going on. And there was my classmate, George Saskas. He was one of my classmates. He was in there having a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'd give him a couple of cases of, or cases of beer. And they were docked in there, and I wasn't aware of that. And uh, so I was really surprised to see him there. And, but uh, I didn't arrest anybody. <laughs> but they shared a beer with you, right? So of course No, I, I was on duty. I couldn't have a, I couldn't have a beer. But, uh, so that was mainly, we, you know, we, we, we patrolled every day. We, we, go on patrol, but things got pretty quiet about all the activity there was, was the, was the uh, guy on the bicycle with a buggy behind him collecting human waste. And uh, unfortunately, one of our, our guys driving their company Jeep ran into him, and we, had, we just ran that Jeep into the ocean and forgot about it. <laughs> And uh, so that's what, that was our, our main deal was, was uh, just maintaining a patrol and make sure everything was, was going. But they pretty well, when, when the emperor spoke in Japan, everybody jumped. There was nobody held back. If he said, turn in your weapons, you turned in your weapons. You didn't keep anything back. And, uh, so the only, only people that we saw really was kids coming around, you know, looking for something to eat. And, and we were issued cigarettes, and I never did smoke. I still don't smoke. And I'd get a carton of cigarettes. And, and uh, I had one uh, particular elderly Japanese that came to where we were camped, and I'd give him my cigarettes. And he'd, I forget what he was giving me in exchange. I don't even remember. Probably didn't get anything, but uh, I had no use of keeping them. So we went on with that, and uh, 
I forget how long I stayed there, but there was no, absolutely no resistance at all, and uh, which was which was kind of good because the place was really had been pretty well blown up. And then the, like I said that <clears throat> police chief, he was a he was from Chicago, and he and he he had one record he played over and over and over, and, and had us over there for for a beer and listen to that record. Well, how were you notified that your tour was coming to an end? I, I don't remember just how that came about, but some of the guys were uh, ahead of us were, were packing up, and I think there was a different and that was a different unit that got notified ahead of us. And we got the information back from them that, that they were going back. And then we started preparing to, to go back too. And uh, we gathered in that, and we were given a, given a chance to enter, re-enlist in, in another outfit if we wanted or, or what we wanted to do. Well, I wasn't ready to leave. So I, I signed up for the Second Armored Division, and uh, and when I got back, then I went in, back in training in Camp Hood. We all went back together in the same boat. Well, what you you mentioned on the trip back, you actually made a stop somewhere before coming back to Memphis. right. Where was that? It was in Hawaii, and when we pulled into Hawaii, we had this, and I. I got pictures of that, and I don't know if my wife was going to make it here or not. With us. But we stopped in Hawaii. Oh, we didn't fight him. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we stopped, pulled in Hawaii, and they were waiting for us. They knew we were coming. And they had a, they had a ship out there with stripped down deck and had. You know, hula girls out there dancing and kids messing around and guys were throwing coins out and they were diving in the ocean and the ship was sitting there. Everybody would you take out how many thousand guys was on that ship and you get them all on one side. It gets a little lopsided. <laughs> so, so the next night they brought another ship out, the flatbed on, put on a flatbed on both sides and had hula girls dancing on both sides of the ship. So were you able to get off, you and the other soldiers, able to get off the no, ship? No, no, nobody could get off. Oh. It just divided the bumper so half was leading off on one side, the other half was leading on the other side. And, and I think everybody on the island was, was, was out there to greet us. Well, the kids especially, because the guys were throwing coins out, and they were diving for them and stuff like that. That was, that was kind of neat. So then, then they released us to land. We stayed there like two days and, okay. and two nights. So you were able to get off the ship for at least a period of time? No. Oh, no? No, oh. we couldn't get off. Oh, okay. Nobody got off. And probably half of them they never came back. Well, yeah, so <laughs> I was kind of wondering how you would have found everybody. <laughs> so. We came back and landed in, in uh, Washington, went to uh, the base there, and uh, I was dumbfounded. It was all Germans. It was all German prisoners that was running that the kitchen and everything else. And uh, so we, we stayed there, I think, a, a day or so before we came back. And, and, and then I ended up back at Camp Hood where I started out from. And uh, I, I got into radio. I was, I was pretty good with typing. And when I was a, a professor, he urged me to learn how to type. And so I had learned how to type. And so then I got into code. And uh, okay, that's the Morse code then. Morse code. Yeah, yeah Morse. that's the Morse code. So and I got into that, and I got to be an instructor, uh, buddy and I, and, and, and a, 
a staff sergeant for Grand Jefferson, and I can't remember his name. Uh, but we, we were, three of us was a pretty good combination. We got along great, and, and we had, uh, we had a different band of students. About once a week, we'd get a different band of students in, teaching Morse code. And of course, the thing I liked about it was that some of them would go to sleep and something, you know, and I'd roust them all out. And I loved doing a close order drill. And I got to be a real professional on a close order drill. So I'd take them out and work them all out. And uh, that, was, that was kind of fun. And we'd go back to the code again. What rank were you then by then? I was just a tech uh, T4. Okay. I, I never did get past a T4. I thought I should have, but I, did. I never did. And uh, so then when the, uh, the, the had the victory parade. This was a big deal. The victory parade when the war ended, and they took the, practically the entire Second Armored Division down to New Orleans. We had a column that ran from New Orleans to the base, and I was driving a six by six with a load of infantry, and uh, and I don't know how many of those we were, but. Uh, we had tanks and guns and everything you could think of. And we took down to New Orleans, and uh, we only run one tank into the bay. That was <laughs> pretty fortunate because I think there was a little drinking going on. And uh, then we put on uh, we put on this big big parade and and. Uh, my buddy, my buddy and I, we got to lead the, lead the parade. And uh, I was pretty good at counting cadence, and I had been. And, and uh, so we, we got to lead the parade down to Canal Street. And it, it, was a, it was just a kind of a magnificent thing, you know, carrying the flags and had all these people behind us and tanks and equipment following us. And, and uh, when the parade ended and they dismissed us all, why, Tony and I, we thought we'd go look around a little bit. And there was a, this, there's a street in, in New Orleans, it's, a, it's Canal Street or what it is, but everybody hangs out of the second story windows. Well, we, we went down through there and we come to this bar. And went in a bar and, and uh, ordered a little pony beer, and everybody bought us a beer. There must have been hundreds of bottles of beer sitting on the bar. And uh, of course, we left them there on a great one. But Tony, Tony was a, he would play the guitar and sang country western. And they had a bandstand up there. He said, let me go up there and check that out. So, so he went up there and borrowed a guitar from one of them guys. And, and sang a song, and that's when the beer really, really started pouring in. <laughs> so we hung out there for a little bit, but we knew we had to get back and get ready because we had to take this whole convoy back to Fort Hood again. You know, we got to bowl down there, and we got to get bowl back. So that was that was a big trip, getting the boat, everything put together to get back, because a lot of the guys were, were still partying and wandering around and run one tank into the bay and <laughs> had to get it out. But all in all, it worked out pretty good, because that was a lot of equipment, and guns and equipment that we took down there. And, we, and I think everybody really appreciated the parade. It was well done. And uh, you know, that took us about a week to get all this accomplished it. and uh, get settled back in again to, for our regular duties. And uh, that was when, we, when we, we decided to set up a code school. And uh, 
And we put that together, and and we had we had about oh twenty about twenty five students at, at at each session that we were teaching Morse code, and, and uh, of course a lot of them just like to sneak in comic books or one thing or another and weren't pay attention. And that's when that's when I'd shine because I loved doing close order drill and I'd fall them all out. And, and work them out, and, and they were ready to go back and copy code again. <laughs> and we ran this, we ran this code school for, uh, I really don't remember how many weeks we ran that, but. Uh, okay. So when did you decide at that point to get out of the army? Your, your tour, tour service was up. Well. I'm not quite sure I, I remember that date or not. Some of the guys started heading back and uh, after we after we got that convoy back to and got everything reorganized, then they then they gave me the job of of uh, doing code and 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 I I would keep the tanks and trucks and they would all had to have a component in there to monitor. And I took care of all of that, all the radio work I took care of. And so when you did get out, you returned to South Dakota? Yeah. Was that it? And then you had a whole nother career. Yeah. What did you do then? <laughs> Electrician. Yeah, I got I got back. My uncle, he was a the, R the RA was building lines. None of the farmers that lived off the main highway had any electricity. So that was the big electrical program the Roosevelt administration right. put out to electrify distant farms? They, they, they built lines and it was called the Rural Electrical Association, the REA. And they, they started running lines through all the farm areas on the half mile roads and and places well, even where the main lines were at. So these all these farms were none of them were wired. Some of them had diesel or some some means or something like that. But we uh, we started wiring farms, and man, that was a that was a big job because we just went from one to another, and there was everybody wanted to be electrified, and <laughs> my my uncle. Uh, he got a hold of the service, and uh, they sent me a box of tools and a, and a, and a belt uh, hanging on the top of that pole when I got up there. And my uncle, he made one for himself, and uh, we had quite a time. Uh, we got to where we were, got pretty professional doing these farms. We could whip it there and, and get those all done. And, and uh, but crawling, the, the main problem with that was that the people that were insulated, the insulating companies with the rock wool were ahead of us. And they were insulating these attics and that, I had to crawl through all these attics in that rock wool insulation to get the wires down the walls. And that, that, was, that was pretty miserable. But we got them all done. And, and uh, I've got to tell you about one particular farm, that, and it was a big farm that we was that we was working on. We had just finished. I was up on the, I was up on the pole, and I had run lines to all the buildings, and and, uh, and that's where the meter went to. And, and Uncle Ted came out and he said, Wayne, he was always really slow about it, <clears throat> about everything, and everything was. He never got excited. He said, Wayne. I think you better come down. He said that there's a tornado coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay. And uh, so I came down off the pole and, and the, the, the man, the, the farm was gone and the, the, the lady was there, they had a storm cellar. So she said, we better get down that storm cellar. So the three of us went down that, got down that storm cellar and sure enough, that tornado went right through there. 
when we came out of there, storm saw that there was nothing. There was no buildings, nothing. And that pole that I was on was gone. Never, never did see it again. And, but everything was gone. All that was left was the door to the top of that tornado cellar. And uh, they had a horse. They had one horse that was, well, the last I saw him, he was having a drink out of a tank. And uh, he was gone too. Well, the neighbor said, I saw that horse going through, flying through the air. <laughs> and he landed safely. And she got the horse and the tank both back. <laughs> and we went, to a, we went to the next farm to see if anybody was hurt or anything. Well, the roof was gone off of the house. But they were raising chickens, and the house was lopsided, and all the lopsiding had lifted up, and, and the chickens didn't have no feathers left on them, <laughs> and the feathers were all sticking up to the lopsiding, so it looked like a big chicken. <laughs> oh. Well, what finally brought you to Colorado? Well, I went through. Uh, <clears throat> When all this was over, I went to, um, oh, what the heck was that town? It was in Iowa. They were building a power plant. They were building a power plant in Iowa. And this was the first of, this was about the first of December. And they wanted to be on the line on Christmas. And, Ted and I, we were, we were pretty well caught up in the, in the winter. You didn't do much work on the farms anyway. So I jumped in my car and, and followed a truck through a snowstorm to Waterloo, Iowa. And I went in and talked to the business agent. And uh, well, he said, we're, we're pretty well filled up. He said, well, I don't think we can probably use it anymore. Well, I said, I'm sorry, but I'm glad you interviewed me anyway. So I went down to the liquor store. I checked on the business agent. I checked on him. And they said he likes his booze. So I went to the liquor store and I bought a bottle of the best booze they had. And I went back to the I went back to the to the uh, to his office and I said, Well I appreciate you you know interviewing me and giving me a chance, but I brought you a little Christmas present anyway. So I set that bottle on his desk, and he said, you know, I think we got room for one more. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to work that afternoon. And, and we worked seven 10-hour days. And uh, man, I hadn't seen so much money in my life. So it was in our days, that was, it was all inside that power plant. And uh, I had learned how to bend big pipe with a hydraulic bender. And so they gave me that job, which was a special specialty job. So I was the last one to leave and uh, stayed there until we went online. And uh, then there was a, just a little ways from there, there was a, a it was a cement plant that was remodeling. And I got on there and got their work. Well, I made enough money to buy two new cars, one for my wife and one for myself, and a new Harley Davidson. You were rich. So I was out, I was out testing my Harley, and uh, I guess I was going on it anyway. Got pulled over by the, by the state police. They pulled me over to, and he said, well, you're running a little hot there, son. And I said, well, I'm just testing this out to see if I, if I want to buy it. Well, he said, do you have a license? I said, what's that? <laughs> oh, he said, you're from South Dakota, aren't you? <laughs> Nobody in South Dakota had a license for anything. If you could drive, you drove. So I said, well, I'll, I'll get one over the weekend. So I did. 
South Dakota did not have driver's licenses until I think it was 1954. When I, I turned 15 and it cost 50 cents to get a driver's permit. Yeah, there you are. So I ended up with that license. And then um, when, we finished, when we finished that second, well, that second job I went on after the power, after the power plant was on the line was a, was a kind of a cement plant operation and they was manufacturing different things. It was, a, it was a miserable job. It was all open and it was colder to heck. And, and I had went down and bought a couple of pairs of coveralls and I think they were saturated with gasoline or something because I was using a torch overhead and sparks fell down and I caught fire. And, and I was, I, they had to knock me down and beat the fire out. And I thought, well, I'm not, I don't think I want any more of this. I've <laughs> got to do a better job than this. So, so I just packed up and threw my tools in the car and headed for Colorado because I heard there was a big job going in Colorado out at Rocky Flats. They just started doing Rocky Flats. And, and I headed out there, and of course I got on right away. They were, they were needing men out there bad. So I got, and my wife, she got a home in Arvada, and we started having kids and all that stuff. And in fact, I was there, some of them are here. <laughs> There's another one back there. There he is. <laughs> my son Bill. And uh, he's working in Longmont on a, what's that plant? Oh, no, uh, Pure Vision Technologies. <laughs> so that's where he's at. Yeah, well, that uh, got you here, and looking at the time, uh, I also see you're wearing a, a special sweatshirt. Oh, today. yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this was, uh, oh, there were several of us from Arvada that were selected to go to, to Washington for the dedication of the World War II Memorial. And uh, they flew us out there. They gave us, they gave us all new uniforms. And, uh, and they had a place for us to stay out there. And we had barracks, and they'd drive us out to the to the memorial every day, and we'd tour the memorial, and then we we had the dedication of the memorial. It was it was really good. Yeah, there's I had some a, pictures of your trip out there, and again, that's the Rocky Mountain Honor Flight. Correct? Yeah, that's us. Yes. That was just here. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and I had a I had a special guide. I had a I had a young young second lieutenant. Yeah, maybe I need it. Yeah. Excuse me a minute, I'm going to start drinking. <laughs> we, went, we went out to the Air Force Academy and uh, toured the Air Force Academy, and we, we could pick a guide. Well, I, I didn't pick one. She selected, she selected me. It was a young, young second lieutenant who was my personal guide out there. And when we got to the... So would you recommend the Rocky Mountain Honor Flight for our older veterans to do? Right. In fact, have uh, anyone else here have gone on one of the Rocky Mountain Honor Flights? Okay, I see in the back. I've as been on... Guardian. Yeah, I've been on two as a guardian. Sir, have you been on to one yet? Uh, not on an honor flight as such, but okay. after the World War II Memorial had just been finished, they had a special deal for staying out there, and my family sent me out, and uh, so I stayed there about, about a week, my wife and I, yeah. Well, I would just strongly recommend it. If you know an older veteran, and now they're taking Vietnam veterans and, and stuff, that era, uh, to definitely apply for it. I think they're going to be beginning to do it again. Unfortunately, the COVID has basically wiped it out for a couple of years. But it's a, a marvelous group, uh, and it's a marvelous trip for our older veterans. Yeah, they haven't been back to group. D.C. at all. It was all extensive. Yes. That was all paid by the 
Yeah. yeah, everything paid for. You get, food is great. You, they take you out to the memorial, and, and uh, that's a, that's really something to see. To tour the the cemetery, they got all the different each battle, each major battle that was fought. They've got those all in statues and everything. So it looks looks like it's in motion, and uh, it's really get treated very well. And you can also go through the Navy. The Navy has a museum out there also. And you can take that in. And that's a really neat, neat trip. Well, to kind of just finish up, what final words of guidance or <laughs> would you have to the rest of all of us as being one of our elders? Uh, well, let's see what it says. John, if, if, if everything's working out for you, just stick with what you're doing, I'd say. <laughs> I, I wouldn't make any major changes. <laughs> Does anyone have any qu other questions you'd like to ask Wayne? Wayne will be around, certainly, afterwards. You can visit. Uh, but any final questions? Uh, there's one. Yes, sir. On that Morris code, you got bigger dots and smaller dots, how does that work when you... It's, it's, it's dots and dashes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dots and dashes. The combinations of them gives you letters and numbers. And the Navy still, I think, uses it in yeah, terms of... Yeah, still using you know, that. Communications between ships with your Addis lamps and stuff, or certainly did while ago. Well, anyway, well, okay. Wayne, when you were in Japan, did you have better sanitation than those locals? Did you have better sanitation than those locals? There was no sanitation at all. Not even for you? Oh, no. No, uh, we... You had slit trenches and stuff. Same thing. They had a... <laughs> we, we just dug a trench in the ground and that was, that was the sanitation and then they had a a trough out in the front of the herb, and you use the trough to take a leak. Sorry to ask. Well, we slept when we slept in this herb, there was a little sleeping bags that are just a blanket with a zipper on. Well, they, they issued us chocolate bars at night. Well, I didn't. I didn't eat mine. I'd, I'd, I'd saved it. But a lot of the guys took those chocolate bars into the sleeping bag with them. Well, they'd have a they'd have a rat in the sleeping bag eating their chocolate before before morning. So they soon learned that was a, really a good deal because you get a rat in a sleeping bag. One of them sleeping bags. It's a pretty scary. Well, just to finish off, I'd like. Well, I'd like us to sing happy birthday to Wayne. He was 95 uh, on the 4th of November. So ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Wayne. Happy birthday to you. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And we'll be having a cake shortly, which can also apply to Wayne. <laughs> so for right now, we're going to take a quick break, get some more refreshments. We're going to re probably sort some of the chairs here. And I'll turn it over to our uh, Nelly. Uh, talk of, if any of you had not attended our talk by Nelly Pollard, Nellie was a bombardier on A6 during the Vietnam War. What, some 300 missions over Vietnam, both north and south, and talk about some scary stories as well. But anyway, Nellie's going to be our host for our celebration of the 246, 246 years of the Marine Corps. Right, right. And of course, the Army is a little <laughs> older than that. <laughs> so, but anyway, thank you very much.